Good evening. You know, the Australians really have it right. Good day. Just covers, covers all of it. Well, let's, uh, let's start by committing our time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for the new day you've given us and the new mercies that come with it. And Lord, as we just spend some time in uh, the Paul's letter to Philemon, I just pray that you would speak to our hearts. I pray you would get me out of the way and that everyone here would hear from you. And we just commit this time to you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, today and next week we'll be looking at Philemon. Of course, as you know, Paul's short letter, it's right before Hebrews in your Bible. So if you get fumbling around, look for Hebrews, go back to the left one, and it's probably on one page, might be on two, but very, very short. With just 25 verses, it's the shortest book in the New Testament. It, it's not the shortest book in the New Testament, it's the shortest of Paul's letters. John was a little bit tighter in his writing than Paul in second and third, but anyway, it's the shortest of Paul's letters uh, that we have, and as such, it can often be overlooked. I've been a Christian almost 40 years, it'll be 40 years uh, this coming January, and I think I've heard one sermon on Philemon in all that time. Uh, and I'm probably not alone. Has anybody heard a sermon on Philemon before? One, two, okay, I'll, where have I been? <laughs> well, anyway, uh, a friend gave me this Bible back in the mid to late 90s, I guess, and someone had given it to him, and he knew that I liked the New American Standard at the time, which is what it is, and I didn't have one, and I saw it on his shelf, and oh, why don't you have it? So, have any of you uh, kind of folks who mark up your Bible? Lots of folks do. I tend not to. You know, some mark, some don't. I'm kind of in the latter camp. person who had this was a Bible marker. For example, I'll show you a few things in here. This is uh, 1 Kings. Look at all that. They were paying attention. 1 Kings. Okay, well, all right. Your 1 Kings looks like that. What do you think Romans looks like? I mean, that's, that's something. Okay. How about this? Even Revelation. Revelation has marks in it. Let's look at Philemon. Not a dot. Not a single mark in Philemon. And that's a shame, really, because, you know, whoever uh, had that Bible, they probably would have marked it up really good. Circles and arrows and, and uh, paragraph on the back of each one. Yeah, kudos to you if you know what that reference is. Uh, I won't go into it. Anyway, though it's short and often ignored, it uh, has a great message. And if you read it this week, you know what that message is, or at least you've read the book anyway. Um, it could be called A Note to a Fellow Worker, if, it, if the book had a title. It could be called A Lesson on Forgiveness. It could be called, Hey, Can I Ask a Favor? And all those would be right. But if you saw the church newsletter this week, I'm calling our little study Big things come in small packages. And maybe we'll extend this to a series on the other short books like Obadiah, Jude, 2nd, 3rd John. I prefer you do Obadiah, Pastor Frank. <laughs> but uh, anyways, Matthew 6, 34 says, Do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And I'm going to get in trouble today if we don't get to back to the point. So what I love about Philemon is that it takes some of the great theological themes that Paul outlines in other letters, and he shows them here in practical application. Let's read what it's all about. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. 
Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me even to your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers I'll be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So, personal letter, you know, one man to another with a few others uh, in between. As an overview, let me just, this is where this takes place. And if you've, if you know me at all, you know I like maps, and I think they tell a story. They help kind of give some, some uh, perspective here. Central to our story here are Rome, Ephesians, Colossae, and then Jerusalem's down here in the lower right, if you know where Jerusalem is. The C is Colossae, of course, E is Ephesians. And R up there is Rome. Rome is where Paul is. Ephesus, what did I say, Ephesians? Okay, well, I had a friend who called the book of Second Ephesians one time, so uh, I'm in good company. Well, anyway, uh, Paul's in prison up there in Rome. And most biblical scholars believe it was during his first imprisonment in Rome, around 58 to 60 AD, uh, that was kind of a house arrest while he was awaiting trial. And wrote, wrote, Luke wrote about this in the book of Acts, at the end of Acts, chapter 28, and verse 16. And then, and when we came to Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. And at the very end, verses 30 and 31, he, being Paul, lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So Paul's under house arrest up there in Rome. And the consensus among commentators is that he also wrote Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians during this period. Church tradition back to the 4th and 5th centuries agrees, and these four letters are often called the prison epistles. However, there are a few commentators that say, no, he was, he was in Ephesus at the time. And the evidence for this, i uh, bring it up just because there's a little bit of disagreement. I think disagreement can be interesting. The evidence for that view is really only circumstantial. It comes largely from a couple of verses in 2 Corinthians. 1.8, Paul said, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength, and we despaired of life itself. Of course, Asia is that area that's now Turkey. That's what he was calling Asia. And then 2 Corinthians 11.23, Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, and countless beatings, and often near death. But I like how the British New Testament scholar James D.G. Dunn put it. The more that is attributed to an Ephesian imprisonment in terms of the length of time Paul spent there, sufficient for news to reach Colossae, for Onesimus to travel there, and for the relation between Paul and Onesimus to blossom, the more surprising it is that the imprisonment seems to have made so little lasting impact on the Christian memory. So we'll go with the assumption that Paul was in Rome. Now, second on our, our little tour over here is Colossae itself. It was on an important east-west trade route, and it's where Philemon lived, and it's where Onesimus ran away from. Now, several hundred years before Paul's day, Colossae was a leading city in the region, and they were known for making a dark red wool cloth that was called, creatively enough, Colossinum. A burst of creativity there. Anyway, by the first century A.D., when Paul wrote our letter, the city had become a, like a second-rate market town. 
Um, the neighboring city of Laodicea and Hierapolis had become more prominent. If you uh, think of the smaller cities, like the Rust Belt cities of the American Midwest, where there had been auto or steel manufacturing plants back in the day, and they're not there anymore, that was kind of Colossae in Paul's day. It's about 100 miles east of the port city of Ephesus, which is our third city uh, in our little tour here. Take about a week. It's about 100 miles. Take about a week to walk there uh, on foot. Now, the church at Colossae was started during Paul's three-year ministry in Ephesus. And we don't have any evidence that Paul ever went to Colossae. The gospel was preached there through one of his companions, Epaphras, who was from there. And of course, he mentioned him at the tail end of, of our letter. And here's what Paul wrote at the beginning of his letter to the Colossians. In Colossians 1.7, and he's talking about the gospel here, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. And at the end of his letter to Colossians uh, 4, verse 12 and 13, Paul writes, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. I recall during Paul's third missionary journey, uh, he spent those years in Ephesus. In Acts 19, 9 and 10, uh, Paul says he was reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And of course, Luke uh, was writing Acts, not, not Paul. He was talking about, Act, about, Luke, about Paul reasoning uh, in the lecture hall. And all that would have been going on around 52 to 54 AD. And it makes, makes sense to think that Epaphras who is from Colossae, maybe over in, in uh, Ephesus on business, heard about Paul in these lectures, went and gave a listen, became a believer, went home to Colossae, shared the gospel around town, maybe even with Philemon himself, and eventually started that church there at Colossae. Also recall, back in Acts, Paul was left Ephesus after the silversmith Demetrius. Remember, they all got together and... and Oh, Paul's ruining our business, and so great is the Artemis of the Ephesians, and, and you know, all that hooey, the monument to debauchery that we looked at in Ephesians last summer. When we say that. So fast forward six years, roughly. Paul's under house arrest in Rome, and he pens this short letter. Now Philemon, as mentioned, was a Colossian citizen, but by now was a leader in that church. He was wealthy, we know that. Back in that time, not everybody owned a home. In fact, most did not. Those who had a home, and those uh, particularly in a larger home, those would be where the church is met. Typically, the largest home among the, the members of that church, the believers there. And that's who Philemon was, successful businessman. He was also a slaveholder, which, again, not unusual for the time. We'll talk more about that uh, next week. But his slave, who was probably one of at least several, if not many, Onesimus, had escaped and likely took some stuff with him. Maybe he needed to buy food on the way, doesn't matter, but he split. Eventually, he got to Rome. If it takes a week to walk to Ephesus, it's going to take a little bit of time to get to Rome, but he got there eventually, and we can imagine that if we were an escaped slave, what would we want to do? Get as far away as we can, meld into the underworld somehow, disappear into the crowd, you know, all those scenarios. So, easy to imagine that. But in God's providence, he encountered Paul at some point and responded to the gospel. And that's where the letter begins. Now, I know that's a lot of background, but I think it helps set the table uh, for our study. So, a number of different kind of themes throughout the book, uh, one of which is reconciliation, brought about in and through the work of Christ message of how God in his mercy reconciles individuals to himself. Here we have three of those individuals. I like how Alistair Begg uh, puts it. Here he wrote it this way. A once proud Pharisee, a prosperous homeowner, and how they are united in their love for one another and in their love for one of the dregs of society, Onesimus. And Paul is saying, and what Paul is saying is that the unifying principle of faith in Jesus transforms the relationships of those individuals irrespective of the background from which they come. I like that. Well, Paul wrote to the entire church at Colossae in, of course, the book of Colossians. In 3.11, he said, 
Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Now Paul's not saying that those distinctions are just eliminated. They're still identifiable, right? Where we're from, the language we speak, the color of our skin, what we look like, all that stuff. But what he's saying is the unifying principle of faith in Christ transforms the relationships between these different kind of people. And that's another one of the core themes that comes out in such a practical way uh, in our letter. A third theme, and maybe the most prominent, is forgiveness. And we'll see that uh, as we go along. John MacArthur said, of all the human qualities that make men in any sense like God, none is more divine than forgiveness. And he explains that in Exodus 34, 6, God identifies himself in that way. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And in correlation, Proverbs 19.11, man is never more like God than when he forgives. Of course, we see that theme of forgiveness uh, all throughout Scripture. In October, Frank preached uh, on the prodigal son from Luke 15. Of course, you know, we all know the story. Father had two sons. One wanted his inheritance. He got it, split, squandered it. And when he got to the bottom of the pit, he realized a slave in my dad's house is better than living in the pigsty here. So off he goes. And he wanted to say to his father, I'm not worthy to be your son anymore. Can I be one of your servants? Of course, we know what the dad did. No way, no servant, come home. And Jesus uses that response to teach us, of course, how to forgive. Father ran to him, hugged him, gave him the ring, threw the party, all that stuff. So how do we forgive? You start to apologize, you don't, you don't give him time. You just embrace him. That's how God forgives, eagerly, totally, lavishly, and it's how he wants us to forgive others. Frank also preached on which other parable? Lots of them, but specifically, unforgiving servant, right? Matthew 18, you know this one too. The king starts calling in his debts, calls in the guy who owes 10 lifetimes worth of money to the king. Pay it now. I can't. Off with your head, figuratively. No, I'll do anything. I'll do anything I can. Pay it back, whatever. Okay, okay you're forgiven. I, I wipe your debt clean. So that guy goes down, finds someone who owes him 10 bucks. Pay me my 10 bucks. I don't have it. I can't. Off with your head. No, I, I, off with your head. And off with his head. Again, figuratively. So when all the other servants saw this, what do they do? They go back to the first king, right? You know what you did and what happened here? You know what? So, and here's where it gets to that. You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him from the jailers till he could pay all his debt. Okay, not a pretty picture, right? Well, the prodigal son, the king, and these are parables. They're not true stories. They're illustrations Jesus used to, to make a point. But the letter to Philemon, it's a real letter. These are real people. It's a true story. And it's, when, it's one in which the principle of forgiveness is fleshed out. Look at verses 1 to 3 again. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine Philemon's reaction when he got the letter? He opened it up. First thing he saw, Paul. As we see in verse 19, down later in the book, this is the man who God used to bring Philemon to faith in Christ. Of course, not only that, Paul was very well known, right? Practically a legend, and in a sense had founded that very church that met in his home. Imagine if you had committed your life to Christ over coffee with Billy Graham, or with Frank. Just a not about you, not about Billy Graham, it's about the gospel, but just the two of you at Starbucks, right? You're just talking about the gospel, talking about Jesus, scales fall from your eyes, you believe. Later, you go on to become leader in the church, you host the church in your house. And then years later, you get a letter, and you see his handwritten name in the top left corner, Billy Graham, Frank Cavalli. 
It's easy to think Philemon's eyes widened a bit. Maybe a little, little grin, heartbeat quickened. Maybe a tear ran down his cheek. Notice how Paul introduces himself. Does he do it like this in his other letters? Well, he gives his name, of course, Paul, and it's at the beginning, which was normal for the time. Think about the book of Romans. If Romans came to church and they read it, but it didn't say love Paul until the end, and you didn't know who wrote it, would you take it with much credibility? So they wrote their name at the beginning. But notice what Paul doesn't say. He doesn't give a list of credentials, right? There's no recount of his ministry in the various regions, the office that Christ has given him, any of that. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. Now, Philemon is the only one of Paul's letters in which he introduces himself as a slave or as a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Physically, he's at the mercy of Rome. But in reality, he's a prisoner of Christ. Of course, Paul, Paul refers to himself as a prisoner elsewhere, as we know, Ephesians 4.1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And Ephesians 6, 19 and 20, And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And then throughout uh, Colossians chapter 4. But in each of these cases, Paul was locked up for preaching Christ and for the sake of Christ, and of course, by extension, by the will of Christ. But by calling himself a prisoner here, it's like he's saying to Philemon, if I can endure the hard thing, of being in prison for Christ, can you do the easy thing that I'm about to ask you to do? And as Philemon reflects on everything Paul has suffered to bring the gospel to folks like himself, I think that's bound to influence maybe the, how he uh, responds to Paul's request. Yeah, I imagine so. I know Timothy is named too. And Timothy is uh, Paul's companion in Rome as he was on that uh, third missionary journey. He likely knew some of the believers in Colossae. Possibly even Philemon and Timothy knew each other. Now let's look at who Paul is writing to. Of course, it's the title of the book. No, duh. Philemon, an individual, our beloved fellow worker. Some translations say beloved friend and fellow worker, or our dear friend and fellow worker. Now maybe when Paul was still in Ephesus before that riot you know, drove, drove him away, Epaphras had told Philemon about this Paul. Epaphras had been down in uh, Ephesus, went back, told Philemon, hey, you got to hear this guy next time you're over there on business. So he does. Goes in to hear him lecture. And he did. And not only does he become a Christ follower at all, they developed a fast and deep friendship. Of course, we don't know. I mean, that's just you know, conjecture, but it's kind of easy to, to picture it that way, for me anyway. But regardless, by this time, Philemon was a leader uh, in the church there at Colossae. It met in his home, and even though the church was uh, likely pretty small, he probably had, as mentioned, the largest uh, church in the congregation. And Onesimus was, Onesimus was one of uh, probably several or many slaves. Uh, the slaves in that day, they were more like domestic servants than what we might think of as slaves of you know, working in the cotton fields or whatever, but still, they were, they were slaves. So, Paul addresses the letter, not only to Philemon, but Apphia, our sister, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. So while it's a highly personal letter, Paul clearly intends for it to be shared with these two specific people anyway, and also read to that entire church. Now commentaries vary, or commentators, which I guess is some of the same thing anyway, they vary on who Aphia was in relation to Philemon. She's the only, wo uh, only woman Paul mentions in the, introdu in the introduction to any of his uh, epistles. One of the leading views is that she was Philemon's wife and Archippus uh, was their son. John Chrys Chrysostom, who was an early church father, lived in 350 to 407 roughly. He was Archbishop of uh, Constantinople. He wrote, it seems to me that she was his partner in life. And many others have thought this over the centuries. Uh, 17th century commentator Matthew Poole wrote that by listing her second before Archippus makes it probable that she was Philemon's wife. Others, not so sure. The non-wife 
proponents compare how Paul speaks about Apphia and Philemon with how he refers to people who we know were a couple, such as Prisca and Aquila, or Andronicus and Junia. Paul does not address them individually or refer to them separately. Apphia, however, is addressed and described individually, as are Philemon and Archippus. Further, uh, these three folks are described by Paul with different ministry descriptions. Philemon is our dear friend and co-worker. Apphia is the sister, and Archippus is the fellow soldier. Now elsewhere, Paul used the description of sister or brother uh, for his ministry colleagues, you know, folks that accompany him, such as Apollos in 1 Corinthians 16, Aphrodite, uh, Philippians 2, Phoebe in Romans 16.1, Tychicus in Ephesians 6.21, and of course Timothy, Titus. So we can't say for sure who uh, she was, but either way, she had a level of status in the church, you know, obviously. Now, about Archippus, Calvin writes, the designation fellow soldier, which he bestows on this individual, belongs particularly to ministers. Now, if you know Colossians, Paul writes to him briefly uh, at the end, in chapter 4, 17, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. So, well, Aphia's place is a bit of a mystery, not so uh, with, with, uh, with him. He's a minister of the gospel. And though many of those uh, who hold to her being Philemon's wife would say that Archippus is their son. Well, either way, the fourth recipient of the letter is the church in your house. This is a private letter, but Paul wanted it read. Why would he want it read to the whole church if it's so private? Well, possibly so the whole church could hold Philemon accountable for the request he's making. Uh, perhaps also they would all learn the lesson of forgiveness and treat Onesimus uh, accordingly. Well, moving on to verse 3. Notice how Paul greets them. Grace and peace to you. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you know all Paul's other letters, this is a standard greeting, both uh, Hebrew and Greek, and a reminder of God's grace bringing them into a saving knowledge of who Jesus is, what he's done, and the peace that flows out of that saving knowledge. Now, John MacArthur points out something uh, in these 14 words that I think is really important. And here's what he said. This must be understood as an affirmation of the deity of Jesus Christ. If Jesus were a man, to make that kind of combination would be blasphemous. If Jesus were an angel, to make that kind of combination would be blasphemous. It is saying that grace which saves and peace which is the result of it comes as its source from God and the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore they both must be divine. So here we are by 60 AD, 30 years or so after the death of Christ, the deity of Jesus was understood and settled in, in the uh, early church. How are we doing on time? Yikes! Frank, this may, this may take more, yeah, this may take more than two weeks. I'm only on verse three. Uh, just kidding, there's, you know, there's so much here, it's, uh, it's hard to skip over quickly. But let's go through verses four to seven here uh, quickly, hopefully. We move from his greeting now into the opening indication of uh, his love, concern, and affection for Philemon. Of course, even though Paul intends for the letter to be shared with others, uh, as we've seen. So verse four, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I've derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. And notice Paul says nothing about his current situation. If I was writing this letter, and I was in prison, I'd probably say something like, you know, despite my confinement, I thank God when I remember you, and I wish like the Dickens I could get out of here and be with you. So pray for me as I pray for you. Well, not Paul, and that's only one, one difference between uh, uh, him and me. So anyway, Paul goes right from to Philemon and others, to gratitude and joy for them. In other words, he's been reading his own letters, practicing what he preaches, so to speak, right? For example, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Paul concludes with, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And I like what Alistair Begg says uh, here about this. He said, and now, as Paul writes this letter, he's doing exactly that. It's full of thankfulness, it's full of prayerfulness, it's full of joy. 
And it's a reminder to all of us who have a responsibility to teach the Bible that unless the Bible is first taught to our own hearts, we have no legitimate basis from which to teach it to others at all. And that's uh, convicting and humbling. Do you have someone in your life who tells you, I thank God for you when I pray for you? I thank God for you when I pray for you. I sure hope so. I hope we all have someone that would thank God, that we would thank God for when we pray for them. You know, I know I do. Now, it might be tempting to think of this as superficial pleasantries or overt flattery, since Paul is uh, getting ready to make a, a pretty strong request here, but that would be a mistaken. Why? Why would that be mistaken? Well, look at verse 5. It's right there. Because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. Paul's saying that his prayers of gratitude are fueled by what he knows about Philemon. Because of what I hear. I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Clearly, the social media of Paul's day was very different than what we have now. And Apostle John has the same message in 1 John 4.20, although he turns it around a little bit. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, who he has, not, who he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. Now, continuing on Philemon 6 and 7. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. And I hear Paul's telling Philemon that when he prays for him, he specifically asks that something will happen in his life. Now, just a quick detour I hear about translations. The NIV, New International Version, translate verse 6 as, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Notice how different that is from the ESV. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. King James, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. At my earlier reference to a New American Standard, that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for the sake of Christ. Now, I'm not bashing the NIV, read it for years, but I'm not sure why they translated it as a specific prayer for evangelism as a means to have that full understanding. I mean, there's a component of that, but it's much more than that. The essence of Paul's prayer for Philemon seems to be that Philemon not just understand and practice the sharing of his faith, but by doing so, it will increase his knowledge and understanding of his faith. Think about cooking, car repair, quilting, welding, any other trade, any other craft. We can read about it, watch YouTube videos about it, right? memorize all the steps to it, but until we actually get in and do it, we can't fully grasp it. And the more we do it, the deeper our knowledge becomes, right, of the nuances and the tricks of the trade, right, that only come through experience. That's Paul's prayer for Philemon. As he shares his faith, he would grow deeper in it. Yes, sir. So is it, uh, from what you've read, is it sharing the, in the faith of the community, like with other Christians? So I, I understand the NIV does make it very evangelistically oriented. So is he saying as, as you share the faith with your brothers and sisters that you grow in your understanding? Is that well, it's both and. Uh, evangelism is a component of it, but that's where, it, and Frank asked if, uh, if, if it's put it in your words. That, uh, it, sharing your faith in the sense of sharing it within the community. Right, sharing your faith within community as opposed to specifically sharing your faith as an evangelistic uh, out, outcome or, or, or goal of evangelism. And it's, it's both and, really. Yes, evangelism is a part of sharing your faith, and we should be doing that, but sharing your faith in community, like we do here, I think is really what Paul is getting at with Philemon. As you share in that, you go deeper in it. Now, isn't that the mission of St. John's as a church? Yes, it is. Wow. 
I have the mission statement right here. <laughs> to provide historically rich and joyful worship that nurtures delight in God. Equip God's people with a knowledge of his word through vibrant preaching and teaching. Encourage spiritual growth in community and empower all of life for a worship in which God, or in which love for God, invigorates Christian mission to neighbors and nations. I think that's what Paul's getting at. Well, we'll finish here with uh, verse 7. For I have great joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Now, obviously, Philemon has a reputation for love. Paul knows about it. And Paul's telling him, your love for me has brought me great joy and comfort. Your love just generally has brought me joy and comfort. And why? Again, that first century social media at work. Because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. The Greek word Paul uses here is spelankna. Spelankna. It's the bowels. Now in that time, in that culture, bowels were thought to be the center of feelings and the seat of emotion, what we would call the heart. Paul is telling Philemon that saying that people are in trouble, suffering, hurting, struggling, I have found Philemon to be a blessing. Philemon refreshed them. Picture a military unit, and this really has military connotations in, in the, the, the original language there. They're on a march, right? Hot, sun, dusty. Crash says stop. They sit over to the, to the side under the shade trees, pull out their canteen and uh, sip away, rest, and drink. That's what Paul's talking about, about Philemon. Philemon renews people. Wouldn't it be great for people to think of us that way? That we renew them as individuals, as a church? Yeah, it would. It would, wouldn't it? Well, we're uh, pretty much out of time, so we'll pick up here next week for the rest of the story. Let's pray. Well, Lord, thank you again for uh, this little letter to Philemon. And even though we've just hardly scratched the surface, Lord, there's so much here. And just pray that all this background material and understanding of the, the times and the culture and the place and the people a little bit will, uh, will just illuminate our knowledge of the, the request that Philemon's making or that Paul's going to make to Philemon here that we'll talk about next week. I pray for Pastor Frank next hour. pray you would speak through him and we would have ears to hear from you. In Christ's name, amen.